the key to grace-filled fellowship is when we become respectful of Christ's lordship. This morning, we are in Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. What I want to talk to you about this morning is two keys to grace-filled fellowship. Two keys to grace-filled fellowship. That's the kind of fellowship that, that I desire to take place here in this local body in Hillcrest. Is that, is that the desire of your heart that we have grace-filled fellowship? That, that's our desire. More than that, folks, that's God's desire. It is God's desire that our fellowship, our community of believers, that our friendship, that our time together, that the, the life that we live together as this local body of believers, that it be full of grace. Now, this passage this morning, what it does for us is it gives us two key truths that you need to accept and submit to in, in order for that grace-filled fellowship to be possible. You're not going to get grace-filled fellowship by somebody simply telling you, be nice, be kind. You're going to get grace-filled fellowship when you accept these truths about Jesus. We'll look at how Paul does this. I find this quite interesting. As Paul has begun there in Romans chapter 12 to tell us what it means to be living sacrifices to God, you notice how Paul has taken five or six verses here, seven or eight verses there, one or two verses here, and he's told us about our responsibility in the church, how to resolve difficulties, our responsibility to the government, our responsibilities in all these different areas of life. And he takes paragraph by paragraph in order to do that. But Paul actually, starting right here in Romans 14, he is going to take almost two full chapters to tell God's people how to get along. Isn't that amazing? That, that is astounding to me that he'll give us, you know, just a few verses about how we're supposed to respond to the government. But he'll give us two chapters about how to get along with one another. That ought to tell us something just by the, the sheer amount of content that we've been given here, correct? It's, it's going to take a, a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of, of humble submission to truth in order for us to arrive at, at that kind of grace-filled fellowship that God desires and demands of us. But friends, it's possible. It is possible for God's people to live in unity for God's people to abide in love and in genuine, sincere, familial affection for one another. It's possible, very possible. Two key truths this morning in order for that to be achieved. In verses 1 through 9, you're going to see that there's a key related to the lordship of Jesus, the lordship of Jesus, the lordship of Christ. Verse 10 through 12, you're going to see that there is, a, there is a key truth that you need to understand related to Jesus as the judge of all. So Jesus as Lord and Jesus as judge. And if we'll understand those two truths right there, we can have grace-filled fellowship. I'll summarize the entirety of the sermon in this. Again, this little sentence right here is something that you can write even in the front of your Bible. It will always be true. Listen to this. We will be grace-filled in fellowship when we become respectful of Christ's lordship. We will be grace-filled in fellowship when we become respectful of Christ's lordship. The contrapositive of that is startling, that we will not have grace-filled fellowship if we are disrespectful of Christ's lordship. Or you could say it this way, the only reason we may not enjoy grace-filled fellowship is because at the heart of it, we're being disrespectful of Christ's lordship. That's what the issue is. The issue a lot of times is not a lack of love. It's not necessarily a lack of care. Those are issues, but they're not the main problem. The main issue is a lack of respect 
for the lordship of Jesus Christ himself. It's fascinating how Paul lays this argument out for us. Let's unpack it here for a moment and get a little bit better understanding. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cite both of these, these key truths you need to understand at the beginning of the section that we're going to address. And then at the end of that section, at the end of each of these two sections, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you three take-homes, three real quick take-home truths. The first section, you're going to get three exhortations. That means like an encouraging command. That's what an exhortation is. I'm going to give you three exhortations from verses 1 through 9. In verse 10 through 12, I'm going to give you three prohibitions. Three prohibitions. In other words, we're going to state it in the negative light. Things that we must not do. So look with me first here at verses 1 through 9. Paul says, as for the one who is weak in faith, literally, the one who is weak in the faith, the faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. So as for the one who is weak in the faith, what is the faith? The faith is the testimony about Jesus, the truth of God's word that have been handed down to us once for all by Jesus, the prophets, and the apostles. So he says, as for the one who is weak in the faith, they're weak because they're deficient in some way regarding their spiritual maturity or their spiritual strength. They're not weak because they lack a number of years necessarily in spiritual maturity. They're weak because they're lacking in their understanding. Let's understand that point. The, the weakness that Paul is talking about is not, a, is not a weakness due to immaturity because of a lack of years in Christ. It is a weakness, a deficiency that is due to a lack of understanding of God's Word. You can, you can walk with the Lord for many years and still be very weak in the faith because you lack in knowledge of God's Word. There's something deficient. There's something, in other words, malnourished about your spiritual development. You've been stunted a bit in your growth. It ought not be so. Listen to how the writer of the book of Hebrews talks about spiritual immaturity. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 through 14, the writer says this, about this, about the doctrines, the deeper doctrines of Scripture, about this we have much to say. And it is hard to explain why, since you have become dull of hearing. He's not saying it's impossible to explain, and he's not saying that the problem is with God's Word. He says, this is hard to explain because you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers. So what is the end goal of being discipled in Christ? It's that we be teachers, all of us, that we be disciple makers. He says, and by this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles or the words of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. D does God want us to be mature in the faith? Absolutely. Maturity in the faith is not necessarily correlated with the number of years you've been a Christian. Maturity in the faith, though, is always correlated with your understanding of Scripture. It's always directly correlated to that. Now listen to what Paul says back in Romans 14. He says, as for the one who is weak in faith or weak in the faith... Welcome him. Welcome him. But not to quarrel about opinions, not to quarrel about his scruples, his, his, his doubts or his, his thoughts, his reasonings that really don't have any sort of legitimate conclusion. You know, we, we, have, we have quarrels and dialogues about matters of opinion all the time, don't we? 
We, we, have, we have discussions about this, and, and really, in the end, it comes down to that's your opinion, this is my opinion, and neither one of us is really able to drill down to, to exactly who's right about this. And Paul's saying the one who is weaker in the faith is going to come in, welcome him into the church. And that word for welcome him, it's an imperative, it's a command. It means to bring that person into your circle. Bring that person into your social circle. Bring, bring that person into your clique, your people. We, we have a hard time with that, don't we? We have a hard time sometimes bringing people who we haven't ate dinner with before. Sometimes we have a hard time inviting them to dinner, don't we? You, you find yourself going to dinner with the same people all the time. There's an issue with that. The, the issue is we need to find our brothers and sisters and we need to welcome them in. He says, ask the one who is weak in the faith, welcome him, but not to argue. We're not, we're not bringing people into the church, receiving them into the, the fellowship and into the body so that we can fight about matters of opinion. God's word is not a matter of opinion. That is a matter of truth. Scripture does not come by one's own private interpretation. It has one fixed meaning. So we're not arguing about this. There's nothing to argue about in here. This is just truth. He says th things that are not, matters of opinion. Don't bring that weaker brother in in order to, to squabble with him. It's okay. So, so who is this weaker brother? Who is this weaker brother? Now, let me just say this. When we hear about a weaker brother or a weaker sister in Scripture, what is our first assumption? Some of you are getting this. Now, our first assumption is it's somebody other than me, right? I'm clearly the stronger one, right? I, I clearly. I, I must be the more mature. Let me remind you of a couple of passages here. That Paul's already set out for us. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. Paul says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, to not think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think of himself with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Friends, it ought not be our first assumption that we're always the, the stronger brother or sister in Christ. We ought to seek to show honor. We ought to seek to know our place. We ought to seek to not elevate ourselves to higher places. No. Think of ourselves with humility. So how does Paul define here the one who is weak in the faith? I've already given away the goat here before I even read the next verse. But the one who is weak in the faith is deficient somehow in their knowledge of truth, in their knowledge of Scripture. Listen to how Paul does this, and we'll drill down to some really, really applicable points. Paul says this. Let's read verse 1 and 2 together. He says, as for the one who is weak in faith, weak in the faith, welcome him. Bring him into your inner circles. Bring him into your community. But not to quarrel or fight over doubtful reasonings, over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. You talk about a verse that could be taken out of context. The weak person eats only vegetables. Amen, right? Eat some meat, right? He says, one person believes he may eat anything. The weak person eats only vegetables. What is Paul talking about here? One person believes he may eat anything. Now, to whom was Paul writing this letter? We've talked about this a bit in Sunday school, talking about the providence. To whom is Paul writing this letter? He is writing this letter to the church in Rome, to the Roman Christians, a church made up both of Jews and Gentiles. And now all of a sudden we begin to start to understand what Paul is talking about here. 
He is writing to a church that is full of both Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, all Christians, but come from very different backgrounds. You see, the Jewish Christian comes from a background of being totally submissive to the Mosaic law, to the, the dietary restrictions of the old covenant. In the old covenant, they were restricted from eating certain kinds of meat. They're restricted from, from mixing certain types of fabrics and doing things like this and doing things like that. And there are all sorts of restrictions and confinements on what they may eat and what they may not eat. And so you have these Jewish Christians in the church. They're believing in Jesus. They love Jesus. They're saved by grace through faith. But they come in and their conscience is very, very sensitive to what a person eats because they grew up that way. That's what they've believed all the way up to the point of receiving Jesus. And for them to eat a certain kind of meat seemed like it would make them ceremonially, ritually unclean and impure. You say, wow, these, these people have a, a great biblical background. They really understand the Old Testament. These other people, they just eat whatever they want. That's most likely the Gentile people's. Not only is it the Gentile peoples, it's the more mature Christians. Because notice which one he says is weak. The one that he says is weak is the one who eats only vegetables. It's the one who has an improper understanding of the new covenant. That's the person who's weak. A person who has a deficient understanding that in Christ all foods are clean. What does Jesus say in Mark chapter 7? That it's not what a person eats that defiles him. It's what comes out of his mouth that defiles him. It's what comes out of his heart. Out of the heart come adulteries and slanders and murders and all things like that. And it says in Mark chapter 7, there's a little parenthesis, and it says, and thus saying this, he made all things clean. You see, the, the mature Christian, the one who is stronger in the faith, has a proper understanding of the doctrine of being in Christ. They have a proper understanding of the new covenant freedoms. The one who is weaker in the faith has yet to come to understand that in Christ, they actually are permitted to eat bacon, permitted to eat catfish, fish without scales. The one that is weaker in the faith has a deficiency in their theology. That's their issue. It's not necessarily a deficiency in their passion or a deficiency in their willingness to show up or their deficiency in the number of years they've been in the church. It is a deficiency in their theological understanding. And that, Paul says, makes them weak. So what do we do with such people? He says, verse 3, let not the one who eats despise. That's an imperative, a command. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. So the one who eats anything is the person who understands that in Christ, in the new covenant, in his blood, I have the freedom to eat any kind of food. I have the freedom. It's not going to make me unclean. Jesus has made me clean. So the one who is strong, he feels the freedom to eat anything. And he says, let not the one who eats, the one who understands these truths, let him not despise the one who abstains from eating these foods. To despise someone is to hold them in contempt, to look down on them. Right, right now, it, it's still not really clicking with us yet. So let me put it this way. Let me, let me draw it into a, uh, an aspect where we can understand this in our culture. So somebody comes into this fellowship. They believe Jesus Christ is Lord of all, died for my sins, raised up from the dead, seated at the right hand of God, and I asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins and save my soul, and he did. But this person does not understand their Bible very well. Paul says, don't despise that person. Don't look at them and say, good grief, why don't you get it? You know what that is? That is arrogant condescension. Paul's saying this, 
You people who know a little bit more about Scripture, you people who are a little bit deeper in your understanding of truth, don't get irritated and frustrated to the point of being arrogantly contemptuous towards people who are not where you are yet. Don't look at them and say, would you just come on already? I, I'm waiting on you to, to arrive at my level. Would you just get on my understanding already? Why are you not here? It's right here. Black words on white paper. It's easy to understand. Come on. Paul's saying, don't do that. Do not despise the person who lacks in theological understanding that you may already have. There are many doctrines that we could talk about that some of us may have a, a more deep understanding of, maybe spent more time in. And just because we understand that does not mean we have a right to look down our nose at anybody else. He says, don't despise them. Don't treat them with contempt. No, what should you do? Welcome them. He says, welcome them. Bring them into your circle. Bring them into your, your group of people that you go eat dinner with or you hang out with. Spend time with this person. They're a brother and sister in Christ. But look at what else he says. He says in verse 3, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. So let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. The one who abstains from food here is the one whose theological understanding is deficient. They don't understand that you can, you can eat all foods in the new covenant. So what happens is this. They look at other people and, and they, they look at them with this eye of cynicism. I believe in Jesus. I believe he's died for my sins. He's raised up from the dead, seated at the right hand of God. I am born again, and I'm going to pick you apart. Paul's saying, don't do that. Do not pass judgment. He's not talking about being a discerning people. He's not saying don't be a discerning person. He's already told us to have a renewed mind so that we can, have, we can discern the will of God. He's saying don't look with a critical eye at all these other believers around you. No, rather than being cynical and being critical and picking each other apart, what does he say? He's welcome. Bring them in. Why? Why should you look at your brother or sister in Christ with a humble, gracious attitude? Why? What does he say at the end of verse 4? He says, for, or verse 3, he says, for God has welcomed him. We need to welcome each other into the faith, whether weak or strong. Why? Because those who are in the faith, whether they're weak or strong, they're in the faith. They have been welcomed by God. And if God has welcomed them, who on earth are any of us to say that that person is unwelcome? Who are any of us to look down our nose at that person? Who are any of us to pick that person apart in criticism and in cynicism? Who are we? We're nobody. Friends, if our brothers and sisters in Christ are in the faith, God has welcomed them. So we need to be governed by an attitude of humility, by an attitude of graciousness. Look at what he says in verse four. For God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? Wow. Have you ever looked at your brother and sister in Christ like that? That my, my brother right here, Scott Lovelace, he doesn't belong to me. My brother right here, Ronnie Terry, he doesn't belong to me. He's my brother in Christ. He doesn't belong to me. He belongs to Jesus. And I don't have the right to pick those men apart. I don't have the right to be unwelcoming to those men. They don't belong to me. They belong to Jesus. 
That's true, friends, of everyone in the faith. They are a servant, the servant of another. We don't have the right to crucify them with our opinions and with our judgments. We don't have that right. We're not the ones who purchased them with our blood. We're not the ones who died for them on Calvary's tree. We're not the ones who were raised from the dead to give them life. So where do we find the authority to be critically cynical and ungracious to each other? Paul says, who who are you? Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? Look at what he says the rest of verse 4. It is before his own master that he stands and falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Amen? So to my, my brother or sister in Christ that, that might be weaker in their theological understanding, their biblical grips on things, guess what? The same gospel that I'm putting my hope in to be saved is the same gospel they put their hope in to be saved. And in the judgment, I will not stand before God because I have a deeper understanding of the Bible. I'll stand before God only by grace through faith. And the same Savior that holds me up is the same Savior that's going to hold my brother up. Who am I to cast a condemning judgment on them? I need to be nice because I'm talking to other servants of the Lord. I'm not talking to people that I own. That puts a new light on things, doesn't it? I need need to be nice to my church family because in the end, they're not mine. We all belong to Jesus. Write down this first key truth to grace-filled fellowship. Key number one, Jesus is the Lord of all, so it's not my place to act like the Lord of any. Jesus is the Lord of all, so it's not my place to act like the Lord of any. It is before his own master that he stands or falls. And he will be upheld, for the Lord is able. The Lord has the power to make him stand. I'm thankful the Lord has the power to make me stand. In many ways, brothers and sisters, I am the weaker one. I will not immediately assume that I'm the strong one. I, I, can, I can think of quite a large number of brothers and sisters in Christ who have been walking with him far longer than I have, who have been studying more intensely for far longer than I have. And when I'm in their presence, I feel like a child. I'm thankful that God's the one that's going to make me stand. I'm thankful that I'm not going to have to stand on my theological degrees or lack thereof. I'm going to stand by grace. And grace alone. He says in verse 5, he says, One person esteems they hold one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. He's probably referring here to Jewish Christians who believed that they should worship Jesus on the Sabbath day. What day of the week is the Sabbath day? It's Saturday. What day of the week was Jesus raised from the dead? A Sunday, that's why we call Sunday the Lord's Day. And so you would have had Gentile Christians in those days saying, we'll worship on the Lord's Day. We worship Jesus. And you have Jewish Christians who've grown up worshiping on Saturday. It feels strange to them to worship on a Sunday. Saturday has been the day that they have esteemed and held in high regard. Listen to what he says, though. Listen to this. This is so important for us. One person esteems one day better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. So if you're going to worship on Saturday, you know it's not a sin against God to have a Saturday night worship service. It's not. It's not a sin against God to choose to have the, 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 the weekly worship service on a Sunday morning. It wouldn't be a sin against God to have a a weekly worship service on a Tuesday afternoon. 
Listen to what he says. But whatever you do, let each person be fully convinced in their own mind. What does he mean, fully convinced? He means a person who sincerely before God has a clear conscience in what they are doing in regards to matters of Christian liberty. Christ has given us the freedom. You want to gather as a church on Tuesday afternoon? We have the freedom to do that in Jesus. There is no command in the Bible that says the church of the Lord Jesus must worship on Sunday at 1030. I'm not advocating for another time. I quite enjoy this. But whatever we do, whatever you do in matters of Christian liberty, he says the first principle you need to understand is you better be sincerely convinced with a clear conscience before God Almighty that what you are doing is honoring him, and you're doing it in a worshipful tone. You know, that same term, fully convinced, just to tell you how serious of a conviction that means, that's the same term that is used to talk about Abraham's belief in the love and providence of God. Abraham's full conviction that God would raise Isaac from the dead if he sacrificed him on Mount Moriah. Listen to this, Romans chapter 4, verse 20 through 22, the same exact word. He says, no unbelief made him, made Abraham waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith and he gave glory to God, fully convinced, there it is, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. So in matters of Christian liberty, Christian freedom, whatever you are going to do, you better have the faith of Abraham in it. That's what Paul is saying. Be fully convinced in your mind. Verse 6, the one who observes the day, the Sabbath day that is, the one who observes the day, observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord. Since he gives thanks to God, he says a prayer of thanks. He gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. So what is the common thread that runs through all of those issues of Christian liberty? Does it for the honor of the Lord? So whatever you do in your Christian freedoms... You better be doing it with a sincere, worshipful, fully convinced, clear conscience before God. That's the point, he says. Why? Why should, why should I make my decisions? Why should I use my freedoms to honor Jesus? Listen to this, verse 7. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. That means the point of your existence you don't live for yourself. The point of your death is not for yourself. Verse 8, for if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. Whether then, so then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. He says, everything you do in matters of opinion, you want to worship on Saturday? You want to worship on Friday. You want to worship on Sunday. If you feel convinced that you cannot eat meat before God and honor him, you better be fully convinced in your mind. But whatever you're going to do, you better do it for the honor of the Lord with a clear conscience and understand that every decision we make in this life is not ultimately about us. It is about our honor to the Lord. It is about our worship... Give yourselves as living sacrifices. That means every decision I make is on the altar of worship. Every decision, where I eat today or whether or not I won't eat today. Listen to this, verse 9. For to this end, or for this purpose, Christ died and lived again. That, or so that, he might be both Lord of the dead and of the living. This is the purpose 
for which Jesus came to the earth, lived a sinless life, died a death on our behalf that he did not deserve, was buried in the ground and was raised up from the dead. Jesus did all of this gospel work so that every decision you and I and any other creature on this earth makes is made in respect to his lordship. That, that's what Jesus demands of us. Every decision, every moment, every thought, everything. Jesus is not, he's not just a, another pendant on your necklace of things that you do. He's not just another pit stop in the week. He's everything. That's why he died for us. That's why he was raised. He did it not primarily for us. He did it primarily for him. For to this end, Christ died. What is the end? That he would be Lord of our lives. That's what he did it for. So whatever you do, friend, do it first by asking, Lord Jesus, do you desire for me to make this decision? Lord Jesus, do you desire for me to go to this place? Lord Jesus, do you desire for me to continue in this or in that? It's all about you, Lord Jesus. It's not about me. It's about you. Lord, I surrender my wants to your desires. And Lord, I'm asking you to change my heart. Give me a renewed mind such that the things that you desire are now also the things that I am desiring. In that way, I will be able to discern what is the good and perfect will of God in every decision. So long as I am submitted to the Lordship of Jesus. Key number one. Jesus is Lord as, of all, so it's not my place to act like Lord of any. I'm not even Lord of myself. I'm not Lord over you, and I'm not Lord over myself. Jesus is Lord. That position is occupied. So let me give you three exhortations, three quick encouraging commands to walk away with from these first nine verses. Exhortation number one, welcome one another. Welcome one another. Friend, let, let's quit having dinner with only the same few people we always spend time with. Let's start welcoming one another. I guarantee you, if you look across this sanctuary, you will see probably at least 15 to 20 people that you do not know. Welcome them. Welcome them. That's how we're going to be a grace-filled fellowship. That's how our church, the Lord Jesus' church, will begin to be known again in this community as a loving church. When we welcome one another, open arms. Why? God has welcomed you. God has called us family. Exhortation number one. Welcome one another. Bring other people in to your community. Exhortation number two, be patient with one another. See, in, in this sense, every one of us is a stronger brother at some times. Every one of us is a weaker brother at some times. In some aspects, I'm the stronger brother for some of you. In other aspects, I am the weaker brother in relation to some of you. And I, when I am in a position of being the stronger brother, of having more understanding of Scripture and being able to disciple you, you know what I need to be with you? I need to be patient with you. I need to be patient with you. I don't need to try to crush you and say, would you just grow up already? That's, that's unacceptable. Be patient with one another. Now, in the sense that I would be a weaker brother, exhortation number three, welcome one another, be patient with one another. Number three, be gracious with one another. We don't need to be contemptuous, cynical fault finders. Jesus is, is my brother and sisters. Jesus is Lord. I don't have to act like Lord of anybody. I'm going to welcome one another. We're going to be gracious with one another. And we are going to be patient with one another. Now, look quickly. Verse 10 through 12. This will go rapidly. 
He says, why do you, point the finger at me, not just you, why do you pass judgment, meaning condemningly critical? Why are you condemningly critical on your brother, your brother that is, or you? Why do you despise your brother? You hold them in contempt in your mind. You get irritated, impatient, arrogantly condescending towards him. Why do you do this, he says? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. He says, why do any of us put ourselves in the place of judgment over another brother or sister in Christ? That's not our role. Well, let me point it out to you here. Notice the way that Paul structures that phrase grammatically. He says, we will all appear before, what does he say? Before the judgment seat of God. Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. He says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what he has done in the body. In, in both of these passages, Paul uses the same grammatical formula. Listen to it. Go, look, back at, look back at Romans 14, verse 10. For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. The, the definite article, the, means what? It means there is one it means it is a definitive place isolated in one area. It is the judgment seat. It is the place of issuing condemnation and approval. There is one place of issuing condemnation or approval. One, the judgment seat, and then in the genitive, he says, of God. The, the genitive case is used to announce possession. He says, there's, there's one place of condemnation and approval, and that place of condemnation and approval belongs to one person. It belongs to God. So what does that mean? Key number two here. Jesus is the judge of all, so it's not my place to be the judge of any. That seat is taken. The judgment seat belongs to God. It's not my position to look down on a brother or sister in Christ and condemn them maliciously. Not my place. Oh, friends, let me remind you here. Let me remind you what Jesus has done from the judgment seat of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 1, what does it say? For there is therefore now no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus. That is the legal declaration from God himself. There's no condemnation coming from Jesus, not because we are sinless, not because we don't deserve condemnation, but because we have been forgiven. So what do we need to do? We need to be gracious with each other. We need to be patient with each other. We need to bear with one another in love. Key number two, Jesus is judge of all, so it's not my place to be judge of any. For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, this is a quote of Isaiah chapter 45, verse 23. Paul quotes it again in Philippians chapter 2. He says, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us, each of us, will give an account of himself to God. Each of us will give an account of himself to God. You say, well, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian, and, and Christians won't give an account to God. Is that what the Bible says? The Bible says, so then each of us. Paul is lumping himself in that phrase, too. So then each of us will give an account, give a reckoning, give word, give reckoning of himself to God. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, Jesus says, I tell you 
on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. So who is going to give an account on the day of judgment before the Bema seat of Christ, before the judgment seat of Christ? I will. You will. You know what? I don't sit on Jesus' throne. So I don't have to pass judgments on you. I don't have to condemn you. If there's things to condemn, Jesus can handle that. I'd never do a good job. Jesus sits on the throne of judgment. So you don't have to pass your judgments on me. Jesus is going to do a better job than you will. And you know what I've prayed for? When I got down on my knees and I cried out to God, I said, Father, forgive me. I am a sinner. I can't stand before you. I can't stand to be judged by you. I'm a dead man. I feel the weight of your condemnation. You know what he said? I forgive you. There's no condemnation for me. I never said once I'm a perfect person. I know you're not a perfect person either. So why don't we just recognize that? And here it is. Be nice. Right? Be nice. Jesus is Lord of all. It's not our place to be Lord of any. Jesus is judge of all. It's not our place to be judge of any. Oh, you remember the, the key to grace-filled fellowship is when we become respectful of Christ's lordship. That's the key. You want to be in a church that loves each other? Then you need to be in a church that recognizes that Jesus is the owner of all of us. Jesus is the judge of all of us. It's not my place to come down on you with a heavy hand, and it's not your place to judge me contemptuously. It's our place to serve Jesus. We are here to serve. That's what we're here to do. We're here to make much of Jesus. Hillcrest Baptist Church is one family learning the word, growing together, sharing the gospel. For whose glory? For the glory of God. This church doesn't exist for us. None of us is Lord. This church will not fall with us. Jesus is judge. So we need to be nice. Be grace-filled in our fellowship. Would you pray with me?